Our last speaker is uh, Linda Nord. talk for 10 to 15 minutes, hopefully 10 minutes, um, on some research that um, I conducted with colleagues, um, Ben O'Connorbury from the University of Ulster, now Ulster University, and Phyllis Grayton from Queen's University, um, on children with imprisoned parents, um, looking at the Northern Ireland research. And we conducted it uh, along with Eurochips, and no, not Eurochips, and uh, and with the Danish Institute of Human Rights. So I know Lucy's going to be saying a little more about it um, when she talks. Um, so I'm really just going to say something about Northern Ireland. We conducted research with prisoners, with uh, their children, and with family members, and with those working around the prisons in Northern Ireland's three prisons, in Hyde Bank Wood, which bizarrely is a male young offender centre with a woman's prison prison unit bang in the middle of it, uh, in McGabry High Security Prison and McGilli McGilligan Medium Secure Prison. And we looked uh, at the full range of issues from the point of arrest, remand, uh, court process, uh, through to release. <clears throat> I'm not going to talk about the impact. I'm going to fly through these slides because uh, other speakers, every speaker basically who's spoken uh, so far has, has commented really eloquently on it. Um, but, but like the others, we found that there was a tremendous impact uh, of the separation of imprisonment and uh, of the experience of visiting. Uh, and as this quote says, 10 years in a child's life, uh, if, if a parent is given a life sentence or a long sentence, it's very different than 10 years for an adult. Um, we also found a lot of stigma, a lot of uh, really hostile media coverage. Um, in terms of emotional impact, uh, we have a child here who taken to taken to accident and emergency in the middle of the night because they're getting stomach pains after after their first prison visit. Um, just so, so I'll move on from the impact. In terms of things we saw that were good, um, some of them again you'll have heard echoes of them this, this morning and this afternoon. We observed family visits, uh, child-centered visits. And in those visits, uh, they're for fathers, and the father can play with the children. There was a lot of rough and tumble, um, and get up, there's, there's party food. Um, really, really positive experience, which children loved, and which dads also, also loved. Is that the child at the bottom, as the father says, it means a lot to him. We stupid things like swinging him, running up and down, chasing him. For mothers uh, in High Bank Wood, there's a mobile unit. Um, it's basically a caravan, although the prison service hate me calling it that, but it's basically a, a mobile unit where mothers can have um, lengthy visits, basically all day visits with uh, their children. There's no staff supervision, so a mum can spend the day, she can uh, make the lunch, they can watch a film together, she can help their child with their homework. The idea was that it would be an overnight facility, but there were insurance difficulties apparently with that. Um, but that's, that's um, what the aim was. Uh, so a really, really good, um, very valuable facility. Uh, we observed parenting uh, support classes um, run by Bernardo's uh, NGO, um, where fathers in prison and their partners uh, are, are provided with parenting support and classes, and then given an opportunity through the child centre visits to put that into practice. And that's some of the fathers talking about the importance of that. Gives you a better understanding of what way kids think with their wee minds from a young age right through to their teenagers. Um, we saw wonderful work from family officers in the prisons. Um, prison <coughs> officers who were 
giving up their own time very much. This work really wasn't properly supported by the prison service. So these officers were giving up their lunch hours, they were giving up their weekends, they were giving up evenings to support families within the prison and in the community. And this is a mother we interviewed in a focus group who said that if I could take my shirt off, I'd give it to the family officer. He's made me a stronger person. He's there to help me genuinely. We also uh, observed and then got involved with, um, and are still involved with, um, family support groups um, run by, generally run by family officers or run by NIACRO, run by the Quaker service in the community. And it was the judgment, it was the importance of, of people who are there to give you respect and not to be judgmental and to talk to people who are in the same position. So we saw a lot of very positive uh, initiatives and very impressed by them. Um, however, the importance of doing independent long-term research and spending a lot of time in prisons and not simply doing a quick tour through a prison is that you can find out what really happens. So you can go on a prison tour and you can be shown fantastic examples and you can interview people and hear about the wonderful examples. But when you spend a lot of time in prison uh, and really observe what's happening and talk to people and prisoners about that, what we discovered was, yes, those things were happening, but overall what was happening was that those initiatives were just being strangled at birth and were, were being undermined by the security-led culture, security-dominated culture uh, that overrides the prisons uh, in, throughout the whole of Northern Ireland. That's part of the legacy of conflict in Northern Ireland, um, where prison officers um, were very hostile towards, towards prisoners and, and, and to provide balance, where, where 30 prison officers lost their lives as a result of the conflict. But we can see it in prisons throughout the world. Um, I think someone said this morning um, that, that prisons are about security. That's what they do. And what we found was that and degrading practices and procedures, prisoners being strip searched on the way to visits, mother and woman particularly not taking visits when they were having their period, for example, because they didn't want to be strip searched. Um, we found that um, child-centered visits, for example, often cancelled because there allegedly weren't enough prison officers to run them. So you got the family officers really enthusiastic, wanting to run the, fa the family child-centered visits. Disgracefully, on occasion, there were actually children queued up at the entrance to the prison, waiting for their visit, waiting to see dad, and the prison service would announce, we don't have enough officers in today, too many people have called in sick, the visit's canceled. You can imagine how upsetting that is for children. <coughs> Even at the best of times, there are huge waiting lists for the child centred visits. So they are brilliant, but they don't impact on the majority of prisoners or the majority of children. We find punishments which impact on children. So prisoners being denied family centred visits, child centred visits, because, um, for example, they've smuggled in a mobile phone or they've been tested uh, positive for drugs. The child hadn't done anything, yet the child's punished. So overall, we find a prioritisation of security over rights. That's getting worse because of the impact of austerity on security provision. So those NGOs that are providing very valuable service are finding that um, potentially what they're doing is, is threatened because of the uh, cutbacks through the recession. So uh, in conclusion, I would argue that we need to protect the good services and the very positive work that's going on. We need to make sure that that's ring-fenced uh, and, that, and that family officers or, or whatever you've got in your situation, that the people doing good work are supported in doing <coughs> good work. We also need a real cultural change, as everyone has said, in relation to children and their rights and, and to, to putting children's rights and children's best interests at the heart of decision making. That means that we need to all go on doing the lobbying work that we're, that we're doing and that Lucy and I will talk about. Um, but um, perhaps more provocatively, I would argue that um, maybe echoing a little of what Justice Sachs said this morning, we also need to rethink our attitude to prisons more generally. These institutions um, have been in the, basically in the form that we know them since the late 18th, early 19th century. They're clearly not working. How much more research do we need to show us that prisons are ineffective, 
They don't prevent reoffending. They separate families, and they do everything that we know operates a counter to desistance from offending. Um, so I would argue that we need to rethink our attitude to prisons. We need to open that up, that uh, discussion, and find better, more creative ways of dealing with social harm, because the social harm that prisons are meant to deal with are creating another social harm through what they're doing to prisoners, to their children, and to families. Thank you.